Hi, welcome back inside the wardrobe. And this week I've been listening to what can only be described as, I think, um, an audio version of a cartoon. It's called Spanner and Spoon. You'll find it on YouTube. And it was created by Gavin Davies and Tom Clark Hill. And it's just a... It's like a cartoon, but just the, for voices. But lots of voices. There's only two of them, even though I think there's about 20 voices on there. Anyway, it's an interesting thing. And I spoke to Tom Clark Hill as my latest guest on the Pod 20, uh, on podcast radio. And wow, is he an interesting guy. He's been through so much. Um, he was the voice of Tony the Tiger. You know, Frosties. But he's not anymore. Because I didn't realise. Tony the Tiger's been banned. Yeah. Anyway, he talks about that. Also talks about his life growing up in America. Marrying a British lady. Moving to Britain working as a musician interesting guy here he is one of the stars of Spanner and Spoon it is Tom Clark Hill Where are you right now? Because that looks like a pretty professional setup you got yourself there Yeah, it's pretty good um, I've got a converted two-car garage uh, or garage <laughs> <laughs> and um, we soundproof the walls. You know, yeah. Sound pretty pretty good stuff in the ceiling. Yeah. And floated the floor uh, at the um, so we could record music in here. And um, luckily, I've got a business on one side. There's like a doctor's surgery on one side, and there's an old folks' home on the other side where they can't hear very well. <laughs> so we haven't received any uh, complaints yet. So you're still but, actively playing the bass then? Yeah. So I what mean, kind well, of all the all the all the live music gigs went down the tubes this last March. Yeah. But I've done a, a few uh, recordings, uh, different studios and stuff, and then I actually did a live gig last week. We played at a place called the Blue Piano in Birmingham. I've got a a band called Tom Hill Seventies Jazz Funk Machine. Yeah. So we 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 got out for the first gig in about five and a half months. And the how did that go that, with the with the social yeah, distancing? Ahead. Um, everybody, uh, they had it mapped out only a X amount of people could be and it was in, and it was in the beer garden. So we were uh, removed from the people. So it was as good as it could be. You were about to say before that there was something going on too? Oh, we did a, um, a live stream from a jazz club in Nottingham. There's a great jazz club in Nottingham called Peggy's Skylight. Right. And then this other band that I'm in, we did a, a thing. So... At the end of each tune, you'd hear the guy in the back go. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then like, what do you think at home? And um, it sounded great in the club, and then the, the mix was bad on the actual recording. So when I listened back to it, it had way too much bass in it. So, What, too much of you? That's not a bad yeah, thing. Yeah, too much it? of me. You, you know how that is. <laughs> and you think, oh, man, I was so obnoxious. Where are you? I'm in, uh, I'm in my wardrobe. Um, in, in our two-bedroom flat in Hitchin in Hertfordshire. Okay. So, yeah, I'm lucky. We're on a main road, but it's quiet now, so it, it it's okay. Yeah. And and your main claim to fame at the moment as a voice actor and voiceover artist is you are the voice of Tony the Tiger. You're great! <laughs> How do you get that gig? Um... Back in, uh, uh, I always remember, because my oldest son, or youngest son, is 21 now, and he was in a push chair when I got the gig. So it was like 1999 or something like that, or 98, 99. And um, the original Tony the Tiger in the States was a guy named Thurl Ravenscroft. What a great name. Yeah, man. And he passed away. And they so they decided to get two guys. They got one that covered America, and um, who passed away in 2012. I can't remember his name. And but uh, people were asking me when he died. They said, "Are you dead?" You know, but it wasn't me. And um, then they got a guy to do the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and all the you know English-speaking stations in Europe. 
Yeah. And so I went up for that gig and there was 40, maybe 40 guys auditioning. And it was every American and every English guy that could do it, an American accent, you know. And um, guys going up and down the hall. They're great. They're great. They're great. They're great. They're great, mate. They're great, like. <laughs> and uh, so then the next time I came, there was 10 guys. And then the next time I came, there was five guys. And they told me to stick around and be the last one. So I think that I they'd already picked me, but they'd... You know, it was a big ad agency. Kellogg's had people there, and it was J. Walter Thompson was the ad agency. And then I got the gig. And that went until, I think the last one they aired was 2012, though. There, oh, really? When the legislation came in to uh, ban cartoon characters selling sugary cereal to kids, you know. So you've been banned, in effect, then? Well, yeah. <laughs> and since then, since then, I've had some... Um, well, so I, I did a voiceover gig once and I was sitting next to a guy named Gary Martin and Gary Martin was the hu the honey monster. Okay. And then across the table was another friend of mine named Eric Myers, who was the Nesquik bunny. Right. And then, so when all this went down, I thought we should get all three of us get, like, get on a park bench, you know, and, and then in character, you know, like be selling the big issue or something, you know. <laughs> Actually, it'd make a great podcast, wouldn't it? Yeah. Out of work cartoon characters from cereal boxes. Yeah, yeah, man. Set it up. <laughs> yeah. So what is the key to getting Tony right then, when you could do Tony? Um, I just remembered what he sounded like when I was a kid. Yeah. And then uh, I added a little bit of extra cheese to get me noticed. You know, I did like a little rap tune, you know. You did? Can I hear it? My name is Tony, the number one cat, and I can't remember any more than that. I don't know what it was. <laughs> you know, and so uh, the casting director, you know, gets the, when you start doing more than what's on the script on the paper, the casting director always gets this look of fear. Like, what's he doing? You know, that sort of thing. And then the ad agency's guy goes, oh, man, this guy has no shame. But, you know, it got me the call back, so. Good plan, though, because they're going to compare all the other scripts to all the other scripts. They can't compare a rap because you it's an original yeah. one. Yeah, good plan. Yeah. So how did your kids react? What age were they when Dad became Tony the Tiger? Well, my youngest was just one. The oldest was 11. So I had an 11 uh, and then a 7 and a daughter who was about 3 or something like that. And when they were little, they thought it was cool. And then when they got to that that awkward sort of like, you know, 12 to 16 years old, they say, don't tell them, Dad, don't tell them, you know, because they have kids falling around. Hey, your dad's great, you know, sort of thing. Yeah, so, so yeah. It's, yeah, so what but, of course... I mean, my youngest son, he, you know, he's, he's he, he thinks it's pretty cool. He, he's never, you know, he, but he's, he's in the, uh, the music profession and also he wants to do what you're doing, you know, have a podcast and... Uh, reach out and all that stuff, you know, so he exploits it the best he can, you know. Well, of course, you've got to. And didn't one of your kids end up being a vo getting voiceover work yeah, my when you first son, moved Taylor. to the UK? You yeah, Taylor, my oldest yeah. son, Taylor, and he's still working. Yeah? We're on, a, we're on a series on Netflix right now called RoboZuna. Yeah. And it was ITV. They might still be showing it on ITV as well. And he plays uh, the main character, this kid named Ariston. And uh, his sidekick is this big rusty robot that was like a work robot that turns into a big gladiator robot. And I'm his sidekick. Mangle. Mangle, <laughs> this robot talks like this. You are your son's sidekick. Yeah, yeah. So it's like role reversal, man. Absolutely. So where did you grow up then, Tom? I grew up in a little town in Northern California called Oroville, like gold Oroville. Right. And it was, it was kind of where the... Um, one of the main parts of the California gold rush went on back in the back in the 1800s. So is that like north of San Francisco? Yeah. It's, do you know where Sacramento is? Yes. 70 miles north of Sacramento and on the eastern side of the valley. Right. right in the foothills. Yeah. And, and what did you want to be as a kid? Did you always want to be a, a voice actor? I have no idea. I, I think the first thing I ever thought I, I, I got into was Roy Rogers. So um, right. I wanted to be cowboy. a cowboy. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I didn't I didn't think about show business much. I, I think music was probably the, the first thing that I wanted to do that, that had any sort of meaning to me. Yeah. But um, I was too scattered. And also I was into sports in high school and uh, partying. So like either one or the other. And then 
Uh, luckily, I was forced to take piano lessons as a young kid. All the kids in my family, my grandmother was a concert pianist. And my mother's a really good piano player still. Even at 91, she's still playing piano. Wow. So we all had it forced upon us. So when I took up the bass at the age of 19, I already knew how to read bass clef and treble clef. And, and I, I was working within four months. And you were working, what, live gigs or session work? Yeah, live gigs. Yeah, wow. I, I, moved, to, I moved from... Um, Los Angeles, I, I moved from Northern California to L.A. right out of high school just to get out of this little town. And then I had a cousin who was a musician in Boston, Massachusetts. He played in the Boston Symphony, but he was a jazz player as well. And he called me up and said, come back and study with me. And I did that and went to a school called Berkeley College of Music. And um, within like I, I just took the summer class because I wasn't sure if I could cut it. And my uh, melody and improvisation teacher hired me for his band and is is one of those miracles you know because he could have used any of the teachers that were great players but he just saw something in me and uh, g gave me a shot you know so i was playing uh and his last name was ruggiero gary ruggiero so we had a our our steady gig was at a place called caruso's diplomat wow. which was uh we called it a mafia wedding factory <laughs> it'd be like There'd be like four Italian weddings going on every weekend, you know. <laughs> I could tell you some stories about that place, man. At eight was it? Is that why, age between about eighteen and twenty-five, you 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 became a bit of a tearaway, went off the rails a little bit? Oh, for sure. Was that but, was uh, that the environment that did that to you? Do you think? No, no. It was it was uh, it was more the the town I was from, and also you know my parents are both. Uh, uh, pretty heavy on the sauce too you know so but i mean it's it that era too you know we did a lot of partying in those days and uh yeah so what was it that that got you finally sober did you have an epiphany or a particular incident or an intervention that was a 12-step program man you actually went it, through are the are we supposed to talk about this on this podcast i, I don't know I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's yeah, up to yeah. you yeah it's yeah, up to yeah. you but i see so you actually went through aa yeah yeah you're right. I still, I still do that. Right. Okay. So it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a daily thing. Yeah. Well, hey, we'll go. How long now? Forty years. Wow. See, I haven't had a drink since 1997, but I don't know the date, and I just stopped. But yeah, uh, people who've been through AA seem to have the date and know exactly the the thing. It's a big deal, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Well, good for you, man. Yeah, what, I just what, what made you quit. I was doing uh, breakfast radio. Yeah. Which means you have, uh, when you have lunch, it's dinner time. So you right. have a few drinks with lunch, and it turns into a few more drinks with lunch. And you end up, everybody's having drinks with lunch. And then we have uh, we have Guinness in the studio, and we have a bar in the studio at breakfast time. And it just yeah. all started getting a little bit out of hand. And yeah. and there was a day I needed to get a lot of work done, because I always used to have, you know, have these long lunches and then have a sleep. And I... And, uh, I had a day when I needed to get a lot of work done. I thought, well, I won't have a drink today. I'll I'll just get this work done. And I was shocked at how much I got done. Right. And, and then I thought to myself, I wonder when the last day was I didn't have a drink. Well, it wasn't yesterday. It wasn't last week. And it wasn't. And I went. And I and then I suddenly realised I couldn't remember the last day I'd gone without having a drink. And I got scared. So I thought, right, I'm I'm going to pack it in for a week and see if it's tough. And it wasn't that bad. And then I thought, well, I'll do a month and see how I go. And after a month, I thought, you know, I really like it better this way. I like being yeah. able to drive wherever I want to go without the logistics of getting home. And, you know, yeah. actually remembering getting home was <laughs> and doing breakfast radio, too. You have to be sharp first thing in the morning. Yeah. And you probably know first thing in the morning when you drink is the worst time to yeah. try and be sharp. So, yeah, it was just. It was partly a career thing, I suppose, but also definitely a lifestyle thing. Just it just didn't work for me. Good I was for you, about, man. I was thirty, thirty-three, thirty-four, something like that. So yeah, yeah. So the uh, you were going to talk about this. You, you said you could tell me some stories of this th this place in Los Angeles where you played. No, it was in, it was in uh, Massachusetts. Oh, this was in, oh I see. So you went yeah. from from your home I, in Northern California to Los Angeles, and then, then I moved to Boston. Is that where you went to the music school then in Boston? Yeah. So yeah. I see. So Ber the Berkeley Music School was there. Yes. I see. So what kind of things would go on in this club? Well, uh, it was owned by uh, Joey Sr. 
and his brother Frankie Sr. and their other brother Johnny Sr. All ending with and, a Y. <laughs> and then the guys that would run it was Joey Jr. Uh, and and uh, and Johnny Jr. and Frankie Jr. <laughs> and there were six Lincoln Continentals parked out in the in the car park until uh, until Joey Joey Jr. got a push because he thought he was a hot uh, whatever you know. And um, I think one time uh, Joey Jr. Uh, there was a bunch of waitresses and and I was there uh, moving some musical equipment or something. And he said some something smart to me to make me look bad in front of these girls, you know. And, and because of my sarcasm and and uh, mocking ability, I just kind of came back with some little zing or I forget what it was. And he looked at me and he goes, "How'd you like to walk around on a couple of stumps?" And I thought it was like you know. Whoa, this is real, you know. I'm from Northern California. This is like the Godfather or something, you know. Or, yeah. uh, or an episode of Wise Guys. You Gorsese's know? going to shout went, cut any minute down. now. Sorry, Mr. Caruso. Excuse me. You know, and I kind of just like skulked off. And um, another time, uh, there was a guy that was causing a lot of trouble. He was obviously uh, had a drink problem as well. And he was in a blackout and was like stumbling in and out of the parties in the front bar causing trouble. And I just remember the old man looking over at this big Irish dude named Patty. And he just goes, Patty. That's all he did. He goes like that. Next thing you know, they, they drag this guy outside. And Patty's hit him with a chair. And the guy's out, passed out in the snow. And an ambulance pulls up. And they go to pick this. They put this guy, you know, and bundle him into the ambulance. And they come inside and they go, uh, Mr. Caruso, what happened to this gentleman? They go, he goes, I think he slipped on the ice <laughs> up there on the sidewalk. <laughs> and they said, okay, and left. Right. That was it. But that they knew. That, they... Was the, that was the police and the ambulance. Yeah, they, yeah, I think he slipped and fell on the sidewalk. You know? <laughs> and, it, and I thought, I better watch myself around here and be a good boy. <laughs> so how did you go from being a full-time musician to, to being an actor? Well, I guess the thing that got me into that got me into that band in the first place was I wasn't just a bass player. I was doing um, I was singing and I was also doing impersonations like I did, a you know, Louis Armstrong. Well, hello, Dolly, you know, singing along that sort of thing. And then I worked up a little um, comedy routine of, of like uh, impersonations that I'd been doing, you know, really old actors, you know, like, well, John Wayne, get off your horse and drink your milk. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, you know, all the monsters like, Bleh, Bella Lugosi, I want to suck your blood. And he had, um, with South Barella, you know, Boris Karloff and Peter Laurie, that sort of thing. So I, I just did a, a version of Misty, I think, you know, and uh, like we all remember Johnny Mathis. Look at me. I'm as helpless as a kid. Upper <laughs> you know, but what would it be like if John Wayne? Well, I'm clinging to a cloud. I can't understand. And then uh, Clint Eastwood, walk my way, punk. A thousand violent. So I just had this routine, like an impersonation sort of thing. And so I was always doing that stuff on the bandstand. And then when I got, um, I did a, a, another move from Boston to L.A. Because I, th I thought, oh, I got to get into show business, you know. Yeah. And um when I got out there, I, I started doing the comedy clubs just on the open mic nights. And I would have impersonations with scaffolded with, uh, you know, original jokes and some stolen jokes and, and all of that stuff. And then that, that kind of got me going. And then I met some guys that were doing some voiceovers. And I think the first one I heard that really caught my ear was Gilbert Gottfried. Yeah. He played the parrot on Aladdin. Right. And so he was at the comedy store and he went up and he came off and he goes, he goes, yeah, I made ten thousand dollars this morning talking like a pack, uh, like a parrot. And you go what? Yeah, <laughs> talking like a parrot, ten thousand dollars. So it turned out he was talking about when they were recording Aladdin, you know. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's I want to get into this man. So I took a class from a woman named Ginny Tyler, who used to be on uh, staff at Hanna Barbera. Right. And she's like was on shows like The Wacky Racers and Hong Kong Fooey and all that stuff. And she liked me and started using me for projects that she was doing, which were actually really hard things for a beginning voiceover to do. It was dubbing uh, English or English into uh, Japanese and Russian cartoons. And right. So, so the words would all be different. They wouldn't. Was, yeah, the mouth movements were already there. You know, so like the Japanese uh, say the line was 
watch out, he's over there. And the Japanese thing will go, like that. So I say, watch out, I think he's over there, you know, that sort of thing. And then the Russian ones would be completely opposite, you know, like, Vorsky, Morsky, Vishky, Vorsky, right? Like, you know, I say, watch out, man, I think he's over there, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> so you'd have to get the words off the page and be able to, to and, and being a musician really helped with that because you could see the rhythm, or you could hear the rhythm of, of how they'd recorded it. And then you translate that into your into your line in English, you know, and, and get that timing straight in your head. Because usually when they make a cartoon, they usually they, they they get the voice actors first, and then they animate to the to the words. Where well, you're having yeah, to do it backward engineering. <laughs> and that's that's what they do with this thing on uh, on uh, Netflix, Robozuna. Yeah. You know, we had a chance to uh, go over the scripts and um, play around with them and say, can I say this instead and stuff like that, and then they would animate it to that. Right. But um, yeah. But, uh, but music, being, being a musician pays uh, dividends in voiceover work, you know, because it's, it's really connected. Yeah. So you're in Los Angeles. You, you, you're doing the, the comedy. You're doing music. You've got the, the voice acting started. Yeah. What was it made you decide to make the huge move across the whole country and then across the Atlantic, you know, however many well, thousand miles that is? Yeah, I mean, most I was working on a, a a cruise ship. I got a job. Uh, I met a trumpet player in L.A., and I signed out the musicians' union. And he was this uh, this little Jewish cat named Norm Normie Fay. And uh, I'd done this jam session, and I'd almost tell this guy to shut up because he was just obnoxious. He was going, "Come on, let's play this tune, and let's play that tune. Come on, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do that." You know, and everybody else is like, "You know, come on, give me a turn." And again, no, I mean, he's running the show, and I almost said, "Man, why don't you chill out? Let somebody else do it." I just shut up, play the bass, shut up, Tom. And I see him down at the musicians' union two weeks later. He goes, "Hey, Tom, you want to go on a cruise ship?" And I went, "Yeah, absolutely." You know, I'm like 25 years old. I'm single. Why not? So I go out and, and um, uh, it was a great experience as a musician because I went from uh, a lot of times jazz, you know, you, you get a chord sheet and you just kind of like mess around on it, but you, it's not as precise as having to play a show. And I got in the show band where we used to have to read charts for singers and entertainers and you know jugglers and all this stuff. There's all kinds of stuff thrown at us. But all the musicians were from the US and all the casino girls were from the UK. Ah, because they like the uh, English accents on the ladies. Yeah, yeah. So this uh, gorgeous brunette named Jackie saw me across a crowded staff dining room and thought, hmm, green card. <laughs> had she always wanted to move to the US, had she? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. No, it was it, it was love. I, I, and, uh, no, I know, obviously yeah, I know yeah. that, but deep down had she always well, oh, yeah, thought she, about she'd, it. She'd yeah. always been into um, the Osmonds. Right, which uh, I I would never let her forget, you know, and uh, and so she she'd been like since a little kid she'd always wanted to move to the states and that's why she got that job. She was working in London and then when a chance came to work on a cruise ship in in uh, L.A. she took that job. So we got married and lived in L.A. for years, had a couple of kids, and then I just kind of had this epiphany one night that um, I didn't want to raise my kids in Los Angeles and. I was doing, I was at the top of my game as a musician, but the acting and the voiceover stuff was so competitive because everybody's got this weird accent like me, you know, so it wasn't like, I didn't stand out at all, yeah. you know, so, and I just thought, you know, I'm, I'm being selfish, raising my kids in this environment if, if I'm not really doing as good as I could anyway, you know. And Los and, Angeles at the time, was it the kind of place you wouldn't want to bring kids up? Was it, was it a bit of that? Too? You know, it, it's, it's, uh. I don't want to. I don't want to run run it down, uh, but I mean, it's it's a whole different bag over here. You, you know, it's like uh, the you know the the right to bear arms. You know, we could we could talk about that. You know, we could talk about gangs. We could talk about all kinds of stuff. All I knew is that when I was a kid, my mouth used to get me in a lot of trouble. And over there, you know, if you if you pick on a gang member or something like that, you know then, then uh, it's bad news. Even if you beat them up in a fight or something like that, they're gonna come back and shoot your dog and your cousin and your grandma and, and all these weird things are gonna happen. And I think what it, the epiphany for me was, it was right after the Rodney King trial too, you know? Right, and I had right. friends. Yeah. I had friends that were, you know, you know, I got, I'm going to the gig, I got my amp, I got my uh, guitar, got the drumsticks and, uh, oh yeah, I got my gun, you know, that sort of thing. 
And um, so I just thought, you know, if, if I'm hanging around here, you know, for this kind of like pie in the sky sort of gig that I'm not going to get because I'm I'm already caught up in doing all the music stuff. You know, I wouldn't want one of my kids to to suffer for that, you know. So it was uh, kind of a, a and and what happened was uh, all that stuff went down, you know, when the, the riots were going on. But um, not long after that, I was living in a place called uh, Santa Clarita, which is kind of above, you know, there's L.A. and then there's the valley, San Fernando Valley and then Santa Clarita, which is a decent area. But a couple of a couple of, you know, middle class kids got in a fight and the next day, next one brings his dad's nine millimeter to school and starts waving it around, you know. And I just thought it's too easy to to get shot over here, you know. So that was my that was my impetus to move, you know. And, so Jackie uh, always wanted to live in the U.S. Yeah, Mar so she, she marries an she American. Wasn't, she wasn't too excited about the idea, man. And then, uh, and but then when we got over here, uh, work wise, my my I thought it was more expensive to live here than what I was used to over there, but. Uh, I ended up making twice as much and doing a lot more artistic stuff, you know. I got I got to get play with uh, some jazz superstars that I wouldn't have got the call for if I was in L.A. because there would have been some better guys in front of me. And uh, you know that that sort of um, thing where they say, uh, you know, they'd say Tom Hill bass USA, like that's going to make right. me play any better than a <laughs> British guy. Yeah, but it that, does sound that's, impressive. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like this holy grail stuff, you know. But I, I love I love that about England. I love the fact that they um they honor jazz as an American art form. Yeah. You know, and, and um we're over there, it's like everybody's, you know, they oh yeah, jazz, blues, whatever, you know, and and, and some people will be trying to get their own thing going all the time, you know. I have yeah. to have some sort of original and, and there's something to be said about that too, but yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a big fan of the blues, and I've been to the U.S. a few times, and I went to to Chess Studios in Chicago, and it's it's not really there anymore, and there's there's a foundation there, they're helping kids, but you know, in Chicago, the blues isn't what it was. I went to Buddy Guy's Legends Club, and it was it was all white people, you know, it wasn't like I was wanting it to be the authentic thing, and it's not there. Yeah. And the biggest disappointment was. We went on a road trip and we were in Vicksburg, Mississippi, which is the birthplace of Willie Dixon, who wrote right. Hoochie Coochie Man and, yeah. you know, all those those great old blue songs for Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf. And we went to the tourist center and I went into the tourist center and I said, uh, what have you got here that's, you know, to do with Willie Dixon? And the lady went, who? And I went, oh, no, I went, Willie Dixon, he's probably the most important one of the most important people to come out of this town and she now i could understand somebody who just worked in a shoe shop or something but somebody who worked in the in the tourist center meeting tourists had never even heard of willie dixon and yeah. she said oh let me show you the brochure for the civil war museum and i went i don't want to go to the civil war i said didn't you didn't you lose that didn't the south lose the civil war yeah. and and i yeah yeah I, I see what you mean whereas in 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 London, there's still a big thing for you know, particularly for blues. You know, was yeah. there just didn't seem to be in in where it came yeah. from. And I bet jazz is exactly the same thing. So I yeah. get what you're talking about with the, the yeah, respect I mean, before, for it as an art form. Before um, Giuliani came in in New York City with the zero tolerance thing, and when it was like really important, really dangerous to go down to the East Village and then even into Harlem, um, I would hear stories of English people going like. Oh, we want to go down to Harlem to the Apollo or something like that. And they get down there and somebody go, what you doing down here, honky? Like, you know, and, and the guy, goes, oh, we want to see the museum. Oh, you ain't, you're from England? Okay, it's down here. Come on, man. You know, it was like immunity because, you know, it was, it wasn't as polarized as everything's getting now, man. It's, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. But yeah, and, and um, I love all the, uh, the stuff about, I mean, the fact that, that I was actually introduced to the blues by, English bands, you know, the Stones. It was probably. Led Zeppelin, mm, yeah. Led Zeppelin, and actually Cream, then yeah. Led Zeppelin, yeah, and then Jimi Hendrix, yeah, you know, who was American, but he he had to come over to England to get to to get seen and heard. That That's right. When Chas Chandler picked him up and yeah. brought him over, yeah. But then then you hear um, and there was a a thing on uh, British blues, and BB King was on there, and he said. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be forever grateful for guys like Eric Clapton and and uh, 
all of these these you know the Rolling Stones and all these people that that resurrected you know what I do you know I made yeah. it so that you know yeah it, it got appreciated yeah it is just amazing how it spoke to it, it's at the time in, in the 60s there it spoke to kids who had kids who'd ne never picked cotton <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean it yeah, spoke yeah, yeah. it spoke to them in some way this this uh and not even working class kids with the blues it was like <laughs> the stones were like all oh, university and art school and and all yeah. the rest of it. it just but it just spoke to them and uh yeah it's just amazing how that happened so when you came over to the uk so it was jackie's family was still around so you used to, you had people you could like could put you up and push point you in the right direction i mean yeah, had you ever visited the uk before i visited in 85 we got married in 1981 mm -hmm. came over in 85 in march and i thought oh it's springtime and uh we, we were in birmingham and and they were in a a, a place that had uh like really bad water pressure you know and i remember taking a taking a shower and this little trickle and like like steam coming off of me and i'm just like freezing man and they had one fire downstairs you know and uh i'd come down you want to shit here tom you know and i just like to huddle around and, and the first the first trip i made was to the store to buy some long johns you know and, <laughs> and uh but yeah she had a great family and her her mom and dad and then she had uh uh two brothers and two sisters and um yeah, it, it was good, good stuff, man. And, and but when we finally moved over, her father found us a house. They'd retired by then and moved out to Droitwich. Right. And uh, they found us a house by them, and uh, helped furnish it and everything. We sent over some money, and it was all waiting for us. What was the the hardest thing you had to adjust to? You know, being a septic tank in the UK. Being a septic was, uh, um, I guess. You know, I mean, I, living living in in California, where I'm from, there was all four seasons. Yeah. You know, and then L.A. I got used to being pretty warm a lot of the time. You know, going swimming in the ocean on Christmas Day and doing stuff like that. Every you know, not always, but then when I moved to Boston, Boston had really extreme weather. Yeah. So you know, luckily I I'd, I'd been through that. So, but I remember uh, we got here in October and like the middle of November, I still didn't have a lot of work. I was starting to make some connections. But I remember going outside, and it, was, it had been like four days of freezing fog, and I thought, "What have I done?" And you know, <laughs> and then and then riding in cars and seeing people coming down the wrong side of the road to me, you know, it was like, "Oh man," you know, was, "Oh no." So it took me a while to to be able to drive, you know, to where I wasn't endangering everybody's life, you yeah. know. And, and uh, but and yeah, you... I don't know, man. I, I I felt really blessed when I moved over here, and, and I don't know if it was the universe taking care of me because my my intentions were good. The reason I came over here was a family move. It wasn't a selfish career move or anything like that, you know. But um, right away, I had names of musicians. Uh, Ian Palmer being one of them. Who you? I don't know if you know him. Graham uh, works with Ian Palmer. He's a drummer, and his uncle is Carl Palmer of Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Okay. Yeah. And his uncle is Steve Palmer, who had the house uh, the house trio gig on drums at Ronnie Scott's in Birmingham. Oh, yeah. I've been and to so Ronnie Scott's in So within the first in couple of weeks, I met Ian down at Ronnie's. He introduced me to Steve. On oh, Broad had Street. Me, yeah. yeah, and Steve had me sit in at some gig at the uh, uh, on the Hagley Road. And um, a couple of weeks later, the bass player from the house band, a guy named Tubby Dunn, uh, was going to go on holiday for a couple of weeks. And there I was filling in for him at Ronnie Scott's, made a bunch of connections. And, and so I started working right away. And one and the receptionist at Ronnie Scott's was a woman named Diane or D or something, and she also worked uh, for immigration at the airport. And so I I go down to try to get the permanent resident sticker sticker into my uh, passport, and I'm at the back of this line. There's about 20 guys in front of me like that, and I see her behind the desk, and I kind of like catch her eye, and she comes walking out and kind of like sternly looks at me and she goes, "You," she goes, "Come here," like I've been in trouble or something like that. And it takes me over to this other thing, and then and then she and then uh, she she says, "I'm not going to smile, but you'll understand." And blah, blah 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 does all this paperwork, and then bang, you know, like I've got I've got this permanent residency sticker because I I met her at at the at the Roddy's, you know. Wow, then, what a nice piece of luck that was then. Yeah, and the same thing happened too. I mean, as far as getting in the union, there's a piano player named John Patrick, who's uh, real famous around 
the Midlands, and actually the UK, he's always been re real involved in the union. And I'm not sure if he was president of the, of the MU when I moved over here, or he was like one of the top guys. And I had his number from somebody over there as well. And I, I went down to where he was playing at a place called the Bear in, in uh, Bearwood Road in Birmingham. And I uh, introduced myself to him. And then next thing I know, he's called me for a gig and fast tracked me into the union, the MU as well. Yeah. So it seemed like the stars were all lined up, you know. But you had tragedy, though. How long were you here before you lost Jackie? Well, we had two kids when we got here. My second son was four months, and my oldest was four years. And then uh, we had a, a daughter and another son. And she, my youngest son was six when Jackie got diagnosed in 2005. And then she passed away. She lasted five years, and she passed away in, in 2010. And how did you make it through that without having a drink or going off the rails or saying to hell with it, let's let's go back to the States? How did you keep it all together and, and on track? Well, the um, the program teaches us that uh, the root of our disease isn't uh, alcohol, it's selfishness and self-centeredness. Okay. And so for me to uh, go off the rails and, and, and start uh, partying and getting drunk to escape my feelings and stuff and not be of service to my kids would have been total selfishness, you know? Yeah. And, um, and that's what I was going to say too, when we were talking about it earlier, you know, somebody like you would probably be just considered a heavy drinker. Yeah. That you all of a sudden something, and it says it in the book too, there's, you know, there's social drinkers, heavy drinkers, and then the real alcoholic. I and see. for the real alcoholic, alcohol is not the problem, it's the solution. I don't like life on life's terms, so I medicate myself with alcohol or all that other stuff and, and just to change the way I feel. And after a while, it, it becomes, it has an energy and a life of its own to where I don't have a choice anymore. Like that day you said, I'm just not going to drink today. You didn't. Yeah. But for me, it, it, I would have to have something else to do. And what, what AA does, it doesn't tell you how not to drink, it tells you what to do instead. Right. And what I have to do instead is clear away, I have to surrender to a power greater than myself. It doesn't have to be God, it doesn't have to be Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, the oak tree in the garden or something like that. It could just be your conscience, you know, because every time somebody does self something self-destructive and you ask them, you say, wasn't there a little voice telling you not to do that, not to not hurt yourself? And they go, yeah. I say, well, that can be your higher power until you have a deeper sort of a level of understanding of spirituality, you know. So if I if I ask myself, you know, OK, my wife's dying. Um, this hurts a lot. You know, should I medicate myself? What do you think, higher power? And he'll say, no, you you selfish little <laughs> jerk. <laughs> yeah. Go hug your kids, man. You know, yeah. go help somebody else, man. Be a service, you know. And, and I and I was surrounded by. Um, people in the program that could see it like even over the years when uh the care kind of got to me as well i wasn't eating right somebody told me you know you look terrible you better start eating better and taking care of yourself you know or else you know the whole thing about when the plane's going down you put the air mask over your face first yeah. then help your kids that sort of thing yeah you know we need we need people to pull us up on that in life too people that care about us you know and i and i was because of the program i was surrounded by guys like that men and women you know Wow, and you got through it. What yeah. a thing. I can't even my, imagine what that was. Yeah, my like. kids my kids bounce back quicker than me. Yeah. You know, but but um yeah, it's been an you know, it's been ten years. We um August thirtieth, it was ten years since she passed away. And um, you know, but you know, it's it's the whole thing, you know, uh I read a book called the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, you know, and it talks about how Western people we we avoid death at any cost you know and we avoid aging you know uh, all the products we sell the fountain of youth you know and and then we hide away our our old people you know and stick them in a home somewhere whereas a lot of other cultures you know you even if you your mom or your dad had dementia and like that you know that'd be, that'd be part of the deal you know you'd you'd take care of them you know mm -hmm. and here we're, we're shown to just kind of push it out of the way don't think about it that sort of thing too so um I, it changed that that whole experience made me a lot more uh, acceptant that you know we're all gonna die you know and and every and the only thing you can expect is change mm. 
And that drummer that I was talking about, you know, he told me something that, that uh, uh, the Buddhists kind of the way they look at life or a way of something that he does, because, you know, and a part of part of the, the AA program or, or part of, of is that you reach out to people. You try to help somebody else um, on a daily basis and um, prayer and meditation, that sort of thing. But I, one day I didn't feel like calling anybody on the program. I just called I called uh, Steve because. He seems like one of the most peaceful guys I've ever met, you know. And I said, so what, what do you do? And he goes, well, we've got a thing called PIX, P-I-K-S. And P stands for precious life. Like every day you wake up, hey, that's precious, you know. Don't take it for granted. Your heart's still breathing, beating. Your your lungs are still breathing. you got a chance to be uh, happy and joyous and free in the moment, that sort of thing. And then I stands for impermanence, is that no matter what, everything is going to change. K stands for karma. And, uh, you know, you, there's other ways, you know, the Bible says, as you reap, so shall you sow. And, you know, and, and also, you know, if, if you fill your head full of a bunch of negative stuff, next thing you know, a lot of negative stuff starts happening or you just can't get out of a rut. And then the last one was uh, samsara or suffering, is that there's always going to be suffering in life. And that, that um, you know, a lot of people get sober and then think the world owes them a living. Yeah, you know, so I get sober. I stop. I stop drinking a case of Jack Daniels every day, and now I got to pay my taxes. <laughs> you know, or, yeah. you know all this stuff. You know, it's like we're very childish. You know, uh, people addicts addicts in the in their in their addiction bubble are yeah. very childish, man. You know, it's all about that sort of thing. So as long as I realize that every day is precious, uh, it's impermanent. Um, if I if I put out good stuff, I'll get it back sooner or later, and that uh, life ain't fair. So just deal with it, whatever's coming down the the thing. And that's what I did with Jackie, you know. And you, you moved on, and you have a new wife now. Yeah. So life life is good right now. It's all right, man. One day at a time. Yeah. This this and and it, just this whole um, this whole uh, lockdown has been a, an interesting time as well, man. Watching. You know, people that that uh, thought they had all their ducks lined up. You know, all the all the anybody that performs. Yeah. You know, it's it's just like the rug rug's been ripped out from underneath them. Yeah. And um, I was lucky enough. I, I got a, a <laughs> I had a, a a company call me up to uh, to do a nature uh, series, and I I can't say what it is or, or what happened because it, it's still not out there yet or something like that. But they said, uh, you know, we've got this cutting edge thing and we're looking for a real top shelf sort of a star to voice it. And I said, yeah. And they said, wonder if you could do the placeholders till we find one. <laughs> Talk about give with one hand and slap you with the other. Yeah. yeah. And I wow. said, and I said, and, you know, so that <laughs> my, my ego said, ouch. And, uh, and my pocketbook said, yes. And, uh, and I did it. And, and the guy that they got in fairness, was a lot younger and also he's a movie star and a TV star and also what he does some of the movies that he's done make it so that he's the perfect guy to kind of kind of do this series you know right and, can you say who that and, is no not okay. yet and uh, but luckily um too is that uh they uh well maybe I shouldn't even go on anymore but anyway <laughs> I had that thing to do and then yeah. also some uh uh a friend of mine was was uh, doing virtual online horse racing, right? So they they got like footage of old races and instead of they changed the uh, the names to numbers, you know. Yeah. So coming around the final turn, number three is passing number nine, and across the line it's seven. Right, that yeah. Sort of stuff. So I they used to have that up. at Butlin's holiday camps years ago. They used to have canned horse racing, and they did it yeah. that way. They they redid the commentary with the, just the numbers, yeah, and you bet yeah, on yeah. the numbers, yeah. So I did that, and then yeah. Uh, some radio ads, you know, some radio ads kept going through the thing, but not as much. So I've, I've done okay, man. You know, luckily, one day at a time, knock on wood. It's it's weird. There's something I've got into recently is because just before uh, lockdown, I was I was running a radio station in London. I was the program director at Fix Radio. And, and they fired me, which is what happens in radio every now and again, tends to yeah. happen. And so we went on holiday to New Zealand, and that was a disaster because, you know, 
lockdown happened kind of at that time and we were oh, we were due to go to a radio convention in Los Angeles where I was due to meet people and we were, had some friends to meet in Sydney and some of them were radio people because we used to live in Australia and we couldn't get to Australia because they brought in a that you couldn't go in without quarantine and everything anyway we came back and it's, it's like and now I'm out of work and you know there's there's like everyone interviews I had set up with the BBC and that no one wants to talk to you and you know everything's on hold yeah. so I started looking online what I could do and I found you can do audio books yeah. and I've got seven for sale on already right now oh, good for you man yeah and I've I've been loving it. I was doing one this morning I was doing a, um, a business one on how to deal with remote workers this morning are and you so, editing them yourself yeah I produce the whole thing you do yeah. you do the whole thing and then they you, you get a, a price per finished hour and it Work, works out okay and it's it you know it's been great and that's something i would never have got into and i've done some fabulous books i did a time travel one a few weeks ago it was good fun and i did all the characters and stuff so cool man. There's, there's opportunity it sometimes the world forces you into you know making decisions you wouldn't normally take and you just have to yeah. go with what's there and what's going good well yeah. it used to be when i moved here in 93 you know it used to be like if you're a serious voiceover you gotta, you gotta say that you live in London. Yeah. And and I said, well, I'm not gonna live in London. I live in Droitwich, and so I bucked that. And then I started getting work in um, Gloucester. Yeah. Liverpool. Yeah. Manchester, and Leeds. Yeah. And I would see people there that had commuted all the way up from London, and I went, oh, yeah, it didn't take me that long, man. I live in <laughs> Droitwich, man. And then and then when um. ISDN came in yeah in 95 or 94 I got ISDN right away yeah and um there would be guys in London say well I don't need ISDN because I just go into my friend's studio and blah 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 like that but because I needed to get it because I was out in the sticks it raised my profile quick yeah you know? yeah and it paid for I was I, I've just now given up my ISDN line because hardly anybody's using it that's anymore. right yeah and I've got a I've got a ISDN unit called a Musicam Roadrunner yeah. that I bought for twelve hundred quid in nineteen ninety four, and it paid for itself in two weeks. Wow! Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. And and I remember driving to Manchester to to, to do a job, and then halfway back they said you got to come back. Uh, we missed three lines, and I said. And in the meantime, I I had a call from somebody that says we need you in London in an hour, and I said I can't make it, but I could do ISDN. They go okay. So yeah. I'm gonna be I'm gonna get there to my house to do the ISDN to London. So I tell the Manchester guys, I gotta go to my house to do uh, London, but I could do your stuff down the line. So like that was within the within the first week or two, you know, and those both paid really well. And that but is the, the standard now, isn't it, for voiceover pretty much is you do it down the line anyway. You don't yeah. go into studios in London so, that much. Yeah. yeah. So anybody that, that um you know needed a kick in the butt to get their home studio going, this has sure been it. And also the thing, it, it's leveled the playing field a little bit too. You know, the ad agencies for a while still wanted to say, okay, we're all going to meet at Soho Square Studios, all six of us, and drink our latte, and, and uh, you know, th th we're going to have the guy in the booth, and then we'll turn it off so he can't hear what we're saying about him, you know, and then, and then uh, turn it into a nice little social event or something like that, and now everybody's working from home, man. Yeah, the only way to go. So when you've done work like Fantastic Beasts, uh, the feature film stuff, you do have to show up for that, though, don't you? Definitely. Yeah. Tell us yeah. about that, then. How did you get into that? Well, I, I was uh, with a... Waring and McKenna was my acting agent then. And they, you know, I just did a, an audition for uh, that show, and it was like they had three different roles that I went up for, and I ended up with a pivotal role in Fantastic Beasts. Yeah. My name's reporter number two <laughs> you know and i had i had so much more than reporter number one you know right so, you yeah know. but yeah so but that was cool man it was at, it was at the studios what what are the harry potter studios called it's not elstree is it no it's, uh um, it's probably pinewood is it no it's it's north of london oh it's uh, probably elstree which is in hertfordshire the county i'm in right now yeah okay yeah. So Elstree's where they do Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and they did Big Brother there too. Yeah. Yeah. Well I'm not sure, but anyway it was an outside set. Yeah. You know, like uh like a couple of blocks 
with big giant green screens behind it. And so I'm in the first five minutes, you know, you got to concentrate harder. You miss me, man. Yeah. But it's still, you yeah. can say you were in it. You did it. Yeah, you, yeah. you got it. And yeah. uh, you, you were in denial as well. You played Sam Dixon in that one. Yeah. That was, that was about the same time too. Those were both like within two months of each other. Yeah. And that was cool. I got to ride around with Timothy Spall for a couple of days in the, in the car, making those like, it's on the way to where he humiliates uh, Rachel Weiss's character. Yeah. And I stand up and ask her some pointed questions, and then then he jumps up and rebuts. <laughs> I, I get her I get her to to call him out on some stuff, and then he stands up and, and shoots her down. That's in the first five minutes too. So you know, I try to keep all my greatest moments in the first five minutes. So that's right. If you, yeah. You, you gotta... If you don't like the rest of the film, you could just stop that. <laughs> So even if somebody walks out of the film, they still saw you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what was it like working in, in movies? It's an environment I've never had anything even close to do with. Is it, is it like proper showbiz? Yes. Um, the motto that I, I uh, really kind of related to was hurry up and wait. All right. Yeah. There's a lot of standing I, around. I did this movie called um, uh, Entrapment when I yeah. first got here. Yeah, and it was Sean Connery, and Catherine Zeta Jones. Yeah, and um, and I was I was a cop, and I was working with Mark Anthony, who was a he's like a, a he's a, he's a really good salsa singer as well. Yeah. He's the States. He was married to J Lo for a while. Right. And um, and uh, um, the first day we were supposed so I you know that was at Pinewood Studios, and so the first day we're supposed to be shooting it. You know, I get there like six in the morning going to make up and stuff like that and they go oh sean's taking a long time on this scene so it's going to be later this afternoon and then later in the afternoon they go i ain't going to be till tomorrow so we just sat around all day and it turned out i don't know if you ever saw entrapment it's the scene where Catherine zeta jones like she's going underneath all these under laser under the laser beams and she's yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so he's yeah let's take a little bit longer on this scene here you know and then, and then there's like one where you know she clubs him in the head with a briefcase or something like that it was all of that stuff but you know it's all fun. The, the funnest movie I ever did was called um, uh, Wins or Churchill, The Hollywood Years. Right. I don't think I've seen that one. Yeah, it, it, it didn't do too well in the cinemas, <laughs> but it was hilarious, man. It's got so many uh, Rick Mayle and, and um, God, I can't think of Vic. Vic, uh, Vic Reeves? Vic Reeves. Yeah. Yeah, Vic Reeves. And um, one of the scenes I did, I was opposite John Coleshaw. Yeah, John. John was uh, President Blair, <laughs> and and the whole pretense of it is that is that the real Winston Churchill wasn't the the fat guy with the cigar that you guys all see. He that was really a guy named Roy Bubbles who was an after dinner speaker, <laughs> and that for you guys to actually win the Second World War, you needed an American action hero, which was Christian Slater, <laughs> and then he has a he has a little tryst with uh, the Queen, who played by Nev Campbell. And their illegitimate son is me, and right. I come back to solve. I come back to solve the mystery of why you know my dad didn't get any street cred, you know. <laughs> but if you get a chance, well, check it out, man. It's, it's hilarious, man. And what podcasts do you listen to? Yeah, um, I like Tim Ferriss. Yeah. And I, I've listened to the Tim Ferriss ones with uh, Jamie Fox, especially, and. Um, and then just random, but I'm not I'm not real avid uh, podcast guy. Um, lately, I, I think because I haven't been driving around, man. I I used to listen to because I used to commute into London. It was about thirty minutes every day, and I used to listen to him on the train. And because I haven't been commuting in, I just haven't. I, I have to yep. go out of my way to listen to him for podcast radio when we've got yep. a, a guest on or something. I have to go out of my. They're not in my routine. Sometimes I'll walk into town and I'll and I'll put one on, but not often. Yeah, I, I think yep. that podcasting. That's why I decided when to do this one. I I put the interviews as a video and put it on YouTube because I think people have got more time to actually watch video during lockdown. So I right. put the whole interview, the, the video on YouTube and then take the audio off and put it on the podcast because I just think yeah. it, it'll get to more people that way. Relying on just the audio at the minute, I don't think it's it's going to go down as well and there won't be yeah. as many people get it. Yeah. yeah, and also we've all been brainwashed by Amazon Prime and Netflix now. It's like... <laughs> This is going to be great during lockdown, you know, yeah. binge watch this next and binge yeah. watch this, you know, 
And, and it's got me into a, a, a real binge watchy sort of a thing too. Like one of my sons is over. We're we're going through the wire again. Okay, that's a good you show know? though. Good show. Yeah. When you walk through the garden, <laughs> you better watch your back. You know. And um, but look, who who hooked us up was Gavin, hooked hooked us up in the first place. We need to talk about Spanner and Spoon, don't we? This it's almost like a radio play, which I think is is kind of a. a a cool thing and uh i think it's gonna it's gonna um turn into a a, a a chance for us to to do some wackier episodes and get some more people involved because well. a lot of a lot of podcasts are um are like plays i mean i spoke to sean williamson who was uh barry in east enders and he's got one called eden's end so yeah. a lot of that a lot of that kind of stuff is working out as podcasts yeah so what have you been doing with that one then? Well, Gavin Davies uh, is is a great musician and a friend of Ian Palmer's, the drummer I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And I met I met him on one of Ian's gigs in London. Yeah. And uh, and he just started riffing on all these uh, uh, accents that he can do, like he can do a, a Liverpool or Manchester or Birmingham and all this stuff and. And he's got some great voices. And he goes, but I've always wanted to get into that sort of a thing. And and he goes, I got I got these little plays that I've I've written out. Would you be interested? And I said, yeah. So he sent me over uh, episode one and gave me like two or three characters, and we just kind of banged it out. And then uh, he had an idea for the next one. And he's got some real wacky ideas, and I think they're going to get wackier. Yeah. Know? And where but, do we uh, get them? It's on uh, Spanner and Spoon. Is the uh, the Facebook page, mm -hmm. and, and that'll take you to, uh, and, and they've got it. Yeah, no, Spanner and Spoon is, is a Facebook page that'll take you to the YouTube channel. Right. Okay. And it's all on there. Yeah. It's all on there. Yeah. Tom Clark Hill, it's been a pleasure talking to you about your amazing life. Yeah. And uh, I had no idea that Tony the Tiger was banned. Wow. Well, um, any, you know, that if, if you think about it, you haven't seen any, uh, Animated characters saying, you know, come on and eat this stuff. It's good. Even be even Snap Crackle and Pop, they gone and yeah. All Snap gone. Crackle and Pop, they're they're uh, they're working on a cruise ship now. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but maybe you could do me one favor so, for me to use on the radio, even though yeah, he sure. is banned. I wonder if you could say, "Hi, this is Tony the Tiger," reminding you that the Pod Twenty and Graham Mack they're great okay pod 20 and graham mac yeah hey this is your friend tony the tiger reminding you uh, hey kids it's me tony the tiger reminding you that graham mac and pod 20 are great <laughs>